The book of Acts chapter 2 and 38 says repent. Come on. And be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And the Bible says you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you have not been baptized in Jesus name do it tonight not next week not next month not next year do it tonight God will forgive every single sin you've ever committed anybody been baptized in the house come on say amen and the Bible says you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost not you might not you could not maybe it says you shall I believe God wants to fill every man woman and child red and yellow black and white rich and poor English and Spanish with the gift of the Holy Ghost and he wants to do it now somebody say now all the Spanish say ahora come on now God wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost you can get it tonight don't leave without it Amen. Lord, I pray that you would speak in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. 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 You may be seated tonight. Thank you for standing. I want to speak to you on the subject of awaken and revive me. Turn to somebody next to you. Say awaken me. And turn to somebody else. Say revive me. Amen. We know what it means to wake up. Many of us, like me today, wake up by alarm clock. It's a very unpleasant experience, but it is necessary to wake you out of your slumber. Amen. No alarm clock. You don't make it to work. You don't make it to work. You don't get to keep the car, the house, etc. You must wake up from the slumber. And beyond being awoken is being revived. Now, I hope that nobody in this room has to experience this anytime soon, but there is a further depth than just being woken woken up but being revived being revived implies that death has occurred and God could shock you back into life I want to be woken up from slumber and if necessary even revived there is something happening and something palpable right now in the world and in the church. God is trying to wake some. He is trying to revive others. You can feel a current of God that is drawing humanity, that is dropping walls, that is building faith, that is demonstrating miracles. Whether you recognize it or not, revival is in the land and it's in the church right now right now so in the midst of global revival you will have one of three positions you will either be continuing to wait for revival and I hope that's not us you will watch revival and I hope that's not us or you will actively enter revival personally. And I hope that that is us. With all of this playing out, I'm sorry. I won't sit on the sidelines. I won't watch somebody else's headlines. If God can be touched, I want to touch him. If he can be heard, I want to hear him. If he can be seen, I want to see him. In every great awakening, in every great revival, God desires to build something from the most elementary component, and that is single persons, which will then affect families, which will then affect churches, which will then affect regions, and which will then affect the world. But if there are no persons which will get into the ring with God, then there is no growth. No revival, no explosion, but to them that will get into the presence of God. A fire can be ignited which will spread across the church and across the world. We get to go collectively where our components will go individually. The church as a whole can't make it further than our components but if there are some within this wall, 
Come on, some, it doesn't even have to be everybody, but if there are some in this place that will tarry as long as it takes for a breakthrough, we will be a church which is a possessor of breakthroughs. If there is somebody in this place that will pray for the unthinkable miracles to happen, we will be possessors of miracles in this church. If there are some that will come to receive the Holy Ghost, we will be a church of people receiving the Holy Ghost. So I, I, I really want to do this next part fast, and, and so pardon me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some of this. I haven't memorized all of this information, but I need to get through this fast, so I want to frame what's happening now on the pattern of what we've seen in modern Christianity. Somebody say Topeka. So Topeka is an incredibly important Pentecostal revival, outpouring, awakening, call it what you want. It took place at a location called Bethel Bible College in October of the year 1900 even with only 34 to 40 students in the mix of the story, okay? That is not as many as we have in this room here today. What happened is in December, the instructor, Charles Parham, had to leave from his own Bible college for a speaking engagement. So he left the students with an assignment. He said, I want you to get into the Word of God while I'm gone, and I want I want you to find out what happens according to the Bible when somebody receives the Holy Spirit for the first time. How do you know if you've received the Spirit? Look in the Bible. Tell me the answer when I return. So as he was gone, they studied the Word of God and he came back and the students shared the conclusion that when somebody receives the Holy Spirit, they will speak with other tongues. Now that was a very new answer to a biblical question because none of them had ever spoken in tongues before but when they read the Bible they saw it again and again and again and again amen, amen. so what they did was the students at that college committed to around the clock prayer meetings in that school's prayer tower 24 hours a day with every one of the students having their own three hour prayer assignment and some would choose to engage the entire night long night after night after night one student wrote and said we spent every spare moment in prayer or in song or in just waiting on God and the the presence of the Lord was very real this is revival friends when you get so hungry you forget about the clock you forget about who's watching you forget about the minimum you just want to touch God you just want a touch of his spirit you don't care what you have to do or where you have to go or how long that it takes so the students began to gather in prayer as was their custom. And on New Year's at 11 p.m., one of the students felt like God wanted to fill her with the Holy Spirit. And she asked the others to pray for her that she might receive the Spirit for the first time. And as the students prayed for her, not a fancy speaker, not a Bible graduate, not a pastor, but as her peers prayed for her she began to speak in tongues as God gave her the words then after that another would receive it and then another and then another and revival broke out Now we'll come back to this, but it was, there were notable gifts and interpretations and miracles. Excitement was contagious. There was even a young black preacher listening in the hallway because it wasn't customary for him to sit in those classes. He was listening in the hallway named William Seymour. He even would hear all of this and begin seeking the touch of God. Now let me tell you, Topeka's not the only revival in history. I have to go through this quickly, but in in short order, like the matter of one, two years later, because of connections to Topeka, a revival broke out in Wales. And, and this one we don't talk about as much, but the Welsh revival, it is also a critical revival in Christian history. There, a young Evan Roberts, one man, walked into a tent-style meeting called the God Meeting while he was in Bible school. And that one meeting destroyed his concept of Christianity up to 
that point. I hate to say it, but we're kind of in the business of destroying people's concept of Christianity. Not because we preach from a different Bible, but because the author of the Bible is literally and tangibly in the room. When you come into a church like this, you can see God, hear from God, feel God, and miracles happen. When he got there, he began to have an overwhelming hunger for God well up inside of him unlike any he had ever had in his life. He prayed that God would bend him. He records the moment writing this. I'm going to read it word for word. I felt a living power pervading my bosom. It took my breath away and my legs trembled exceedingly. This living power had become come stronger and stronger until I felt it would tear me apart. My whole bosom was in turmoil and if I had not prayed it would have burst but I fell on my knees with my arms over the seat in front of me. My face was bathed in perspiration and the tears began to flow in streams and I cried out bend me, bend me, bend me oh God and then I was filled with compassion for those that must be bent at the judgment and I wept following that the salvation of the human soul was impressed on me and I felt ablaze with a desire to go through the length and the breadth of whales to tell everyone of the Savior that one man would turn the country up Upside down. One moment, one man. One service, you have no idea what God is trying to do in this city through the people that will walk through those doors. What one moment of resolve and repentance and faith could do to change them. You have no idea who God is going to reach through them and what God will do in revival in this church. Come on, it only takes one Holy Ghost moment. When this man was young, he had worked in the coal mines. So he went back to the coal mines with the gospel. He went to the poor. He went to the city. His fervor for God was contagious, and it became uninterrupted years of nightly revival across the country between churches and tents. He would travel with a revival team of lay leaders, and they would become the driving force to a movement that was a handful of just a passionate, spirit-filled young group, including spirit-filled women that would set the, uh, the country on fire they described it saying meetings would go on for many hours often more than 10 hours without a break people would lose sense of time and churches were so full that the crowds would gather outside until they could squeeze their way in the meetings broke with the conventional they bypassed the traditional ministers would have to just sit down unable to preach or understand the phenomena that took over regularly sedate churches and, ca and chapels as the mighty move of God was impacting them. By 1904, thousands were filling the church, leaning over the railings, packing every pew, squeezing into every corner, and they would stay there with intense emotion, not once a week, but night after night after night. This is the London Daily newspaper writing. You feel that the thousands before you have become merged into one. You can watch what they call the influence of the power of the Spirit playing over the congregation as an ebbing wind would play over the surface of a pond. All of this vast quivering, throbbing, singing, praying, exultant multitude is intensely conscious of the all-pervading influence of some invisible reality and they call it 
with the Spirit of God. Friend, if the newspaper knows what we're after, we ought to know what we're after. We ought to merge into a central consciousness that is hungry for, desperate for, and worshiping an all-prevailing, all-powerful, uh, mighty God. A remarkable religious, this is written, a remarkable religious revival is now taking place. For some days, the chapel has been besieged by dense crowds of people unable to obtain a, um, admission. Such excitement has prevailed that the road on which the chapel is situated has been lined with people from end to end. The congregation has remained praying and singing until 2.30 in the morning. Shopkeepers are closing early in order to get a place in the chapel. Tin and steel workers throng the place in their working clothes one local pastor described this in a letter he said some deeply intelligent but unconverted men who had always read led rich exemplary lives would walk in and feel such sorrow of soul that they would begin to tremble turn deathly pale and cry out for the prayers of their brethren others that are very different in their past record even sought in in drink were so overwhelmed that they professed to be unable to continue in their drunken way but they were forced to the chapel and would give themselves fully to the Lord. Friend God is trying to bring about a revival of the highest order and the lowest order. He's trying to reach every last one in our city. Man this it's an interesting revival. It literally across the country, businesses closed early every night for the entire city to be at church. The police department had layoffs because crime was at an all-time low. The professional football teams were disbanded because both the audience and the players had lost interest. Books and magazines were burned and it was replaced with a record sale of Bibles until the stock ran out. Bars went out out of business as everybody had lost interest in alcohol they literally had to retrain the animals in the coal mines because they used to answer to swear words and now nobody would swear anymore when God has revival it will change a city a family a drunkard an addict anxiety depression suicide come on somebody when God does it he does it right Lord awaken me revive me Now, 1906, we're only six years later, one man, that William Seymour, that poor African-American preacher with one eye that had been in the hallway of that Bible school outpouring in Topeka has now been seeking the Holy Spirit himself. He even started preaching about it before he had it. Instead... Finally, he just made up his mind. I'm going to continue on the assumption God is going to fill me. So he insisted that he would fast for 10 straight days. He started a 10-day prayer meeting in the middle of Los Angeles. And somewhere around day 5, he was up all night long. And in the early hours of the morning, God filled him with the Holy Ghost. And he he began speaking in tongues. Uh, that's a great story right there, but it didn't end there. He started a prayer meeting, and when everybody heard he got the Holy Ghost, they wanted the Holy Ghost. So somebody else would come, and they would want to receive it and speak in tongues. Somebody else would come. That little prayer meeting was started in the Bonnie Bray house. I've been there. Tiny, tiny, pathetic little house. But it ran for nine straight years of a daily prayer meeting, and people receiving the Holy Holy Ghost every single day. Yeah. 
I, when I did get a chance to see it, I said, let me see the deck. Let me see the deck. I have to see the deck. Because the story goes, in one of those prayer meetings, they had literally, physically, with their bodies, been shouting and jumping and dancing for three straight days and nights. And it broke the deck off of the house. It literally collapsed underneath them. And they had to rebuild it. Man, I had to see the house. That house is the smallest thing you could imagine. But it had thousands of souls through it because there was a hunger for God. They eventually got a different building down on Azusa Street which is the one that you may have heard of and people would walk in anywhere from 300 to 1500 people per day for years, for years. And there are first hand accounts of people that walked in blind and received their sight. Diseases cured instantly. Immigrants who would walk in and hear their their native languages, fluent German and Yiddish and Spanish as people received the Holy Ghost. Blind saw, lame walked, deaf heard, and the empty left filled. If God did it then, he can do it now. If God did it there, he can do it here. Why not now? Why not with you? Why not in Bentonville? Why not in Arkansas? Why not, come on, in the central United States? Why not? in the nation and why not in the world come on somebody I want to see it I want to be in it I want to be right in the middle of it like I said if God can be heard I will hear him if God can be seen I will see him if God can move I'll be in the midst of the move I will settle for nothing less than revival you could have been put anywhere on the map you realize that right he could have stuck you in New York. He could have stuck you in Texas. He could have put you in Florida. But God stuck you right here in the greater Bentonville area. And he did it for a reason. It is not that you would assimilate into this culture. It's not that you would disappear into the workforce. It's not that you'd be part of popular society. But that you would revive it. You were put here to save souls and bring Jesus. Jesus to a world that has forgotten him. I did kind of write this way too lengthy email. I had like this message on my heart and no outlet. I said it to your pastor. But I talked around the subject of is this revival? You know, I, I, I really believe God is doing something great right now. But as I look at these in the past, I realize as well that God's revivals are less about the geography that, it, that the pin first drops. And they're more about where they're going. If you go to Azusa Street today, there's no church there. There was nothing special about just that building. But there are hundreds of millions of people that can trace their experience back through the Azusa Street Revival. What am I saying? If you knew the magnitude of what God is trying to do here and now, the generations that will be reached through you, the children, the grandchildren, come on, the city, the region, come on, God is trying to do something so much bigger. When God starts a revival, leaders emerge out of it. Preachers emerge out of it. Churches are launched out of it. Would, would that be okay if we had four daughter works across the city? Would it be okay if we sent missionaries to every corner of the globe? Come on, somebody. God is doing something bigger. The way that I would, the way that I view this is like a bolt of lightning in the dead of night. Throughout history, God has crashed into humanity's unexpecting state 
of spiritual slumber to awaken but a few. The thunder of that few would then resonate through the entire Christian world. It would resonate through their families. It would resonate through their generations. It would resonate through their churches. And then it would begin to move through the entire world of Christianity. Every earthquake may have a point of origin, but the move of God then spreads further and further and further. Revival spills from the church into every place that his people go. In the Bible, you will see converts everywhere from chariots in the desert to jails at midnight. Souls will reach. What God's trying to do here doesn't even have to happen on a Sunday. We can baptize on a Monday and a Tuesday and a Thursday. We can baptize at midnight. We can baptize at 6 a.m. We can baptize in a home. We can baptize in a river. But we will have revival. I want you to see a revival as a seizable moment. You could say, man, it's just another service, just another lesson, just another overly hyped up evangelist. But what if we treated it as an opportunity to see heaven intersect with humanity? Topeka was just a boring city with a boring Bible school and a small youth group at it. But they seized the opportunity and they went all in. And it became the epicenter that would spread to millions. Just like when a rock breaks its way into still waters, the initial plank might not be that big but you give it a second and it will begin to move and move further and move further and what God does from the drop was so much bigger than how it started man God didn't just save you to sit there but when he gave you the Holy Ghost it would be that you were like a rock thrown into a pond you'd get onto another and another and another it would spread spread to your family spread to your friends spread Spread to your co-workers, spread to your neighborhood. It would propagate. So I ask again, will I be core to revival or a sideline observer to it? Let me give you just something of practical application as I check the timer. Okay. So, uh, if there was something of practical application here, because it, it is Wednesday night. I'll be quick, but let me say it. One, attendance. Somebody say attendance. attendance. Be here. Be here and bring someone. It is outpouring time. If you're watching online, we are so glad that you're with us online. I'm totally not picking on you, but you've got to come in here and check it out. Because I tell you the truth, God can move in your home. He can move in your car. But there's something in this place that can't always be duplicated. And you need to come check it out in the house at least one time and see what God will do in your life. Friend, I'm telling you, be here and bring somebody with you. Because sometimes, like the Bible says, we lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Sometimes we pray for them and they are filled and speak in new tongues. There is something about the house of God. If we've ever needed you, we need you now. Another element of practical application is that of evangelism. This is tricky to... to explain to people when there is a season of openness they can be reassured by that there are more arriving visitors than normal this is how I would say back to them if you're in the open season you better get out to the field because you're seeing but a fraction of what you could have imagine if you added on top of that because you were passing out cards all week you were knocking doors doing door hangers blowing up Facebook we could have exponentially more strike while the iron is hot and I don't know how you work but here's how I do 
If I put it on the calendar, it happens. If I don't, it probably won't. Put it on your calendar. It doesn't have to look like how I do it, but in whatever form you want to reach people, put it on your calendar because I'm telling you right now, something's happening. And if you get them in the house, God will do something. If you get them in a Bible study, God will do something. Right now, there is an openness. There is a hunger. There is a desire. And we will capitalize on it. Amen. Now let me say this about prayer. We need you to pray now like we've never needed you to pray before. I need you to pray, man. And I don't mean like patty cake prayers, bless this food. I just tell you right now, he's not going to bless all the McDonald's that you eat. It's not, that, that's not the purpose of prayer. But what if, in fact, in fact, I just, if I'm going to say something crazy, what if we drop prayer just for a season, prayer as it would regard us? You know what I mean? What if we drop prayer as it would regard us? That for a bit, I'm not going to come to church and make it about me and my needs and my finances and my job and my kids and my this and what if for a season we came into the house of God and we prayed until we touched him and we prayed until we didn't care about the job we didn't care about the finances we didn't care about the house we didn't care about the kids what if we prayed until God showed up and there was breakthrough and miracles what if we prayed until we touched the hem of his garment Man, we need you to pray. I'm going to talk about services. Man, our services need to be full of faith. We are allowed this many down services when we're in revival. That means don't wait for your favorite song. It's probably not coming because the song's not there for you. They picked it for them. So don't even worry about what song. Don't worry if it's fast or if it's slow. We need you to be ready to worship, full of faith. Be ready for the incoming. That means you park a little further away. You make room for somebody to sit next to you. You shake somebody's hand and you lay hands on them that God might heal them, feel them, touch them, deliver them. What did mark a lot of these? I don't even know how this will look in, re in the real world. But what marked actually all of these revivals was a degree of flexibility. I don't know how we're going to achieve that. But we have to provide space for the Holy Ghost to move. Yeah. Don't be a clock watcher. It won't work for what God's trying to send. If we get, if we get roped into that too deep, they'll end up somewhere else. I won't have a church that has the capacity for what God is sending. If we need to alter some things, we'll alter some things. If we need to do one song and an altar call for the whole rest of the service, bring it on. We will see the multitudes filled with the Spirit, baptized in His name, and their lives forever changed. I hope I wouldn't rock the boat if I say this. Would you be willing to stay longer? Would you be willing to worship louder? Would you be okay if we had to preach a little different for a bit? Yeah. Would you be willing to help us a little more? Yeah. You know, I actually talked to the folks at uh, Asbury College. And I said, hey, I happen to have a really giant tent. And if you guys get overwhelmed and your facilities can't uh, handle it, I would be happy to partner with you. I'll move my schedule around, show up with a big tent, and I'll continue revival. That's what we do anyways. And uh, and they said right now, I, I, that's a great offer, but they said right now we are fully invested in this. We are uh, putting all of our time in, all of our money in, all of our energy in, and we're trying to house what God is doing. Friend, if we're going to house what God wants to do here, we have got to have have the same attitude I am fully invested in this I will help I will stay I will work I will give come on I will make it happen because I'm desperate for revival yeah. come on somebody I want it I want it! I want it! Yeah. Man, somebody would say, how much water can the cup hold? 
I don't, I don't know my measurements. 16 ounces, 12, 14, I don't know what's reasonable for a cup this size. The manufacturer will tell you what this cup will hold. Hey, you know, the enemy wants to tell you what this church can hold. Man, they could take another 10 and they're done. Man, they could take another 20 and then all their systems break. That's really not true because what we can hold changes if we have more holders. If I've got this cup and another cup and another cup and another cup, well, now I can hold double, triple, quadruple. What am I saying? We can only hold what we can right now, but if you would jump in and help us hold, God will send more and more and more. Come on somebody if we need you to bring towels bring towels that we might baptize more if we need you to bring a change of clothes bring clothes because we won't have enough robes if we need you to drive a van give a ride teach a class come on we need more holders that God can send us more man we need just two other things. One is the word. How many love the word? Oh, yeah. Man, you need to really love the word right now. If you don't love the word, you can go all kinds of sideways. But the word is power. It will change you. And all of a sudden, that crazy little devotion that you read each day will be the exact verse that you needed to change somebody else's life. But you can't give what you don't got, so get in the word. Amen. I have young preachers come up to me all the time and say, man, I want to do what you're doing. I said, man, I don't even know what I'm doing. So I, w I would set your sights higher, but I know this much. Read the word, and it tends to work out. Amen. And let me tell you, the last thing we need is the rest. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. Pastor will tell you. Pastor will tell you. Man, I'll tell churches all the time, you want to know what's going to happen on Sunday of revival? Watch what happens on Saturday. If we call outreach and 1% of the church is there, man, Sunday's going to be a dud. But if we call outreach and you got 50% of your church on outreach, you better buckle up. Something's going to go down. What if, I, and I'm just talking about outreach. What if it's not outreach? What if pastor says, hey, we need to fast? What proportion of the church rises to the occasion and says, if the need is fasting, sign me up. I will fast. What if he says, we need to give? What proportion says, I will give? What if he says, we need to stay late? How many stay late? Come on. We need to be bought in. So I will tell you this, in over 16 years of outreach-based ministry, I've never seen hunger and effectiveness like we're seeing it right now. Right now, I want to tell you, God can reach every one of those that you thought were unreachable. Even if you don't see it on the outside right now, I promise behind that hidden screen that they're sending up, they are hungrier than they have ever been. Right now, we have a better chance of reaching senators. We have a better chance of reaching governors. We have a better chance of reaching CEOs. We have a better chance of reaching crack addicts and homeless right now there is a hunger and openness in humanity and the church will capitalize amen if you stand together with me if I asked you is this revival what would you say I think I would have to say it's the start. But will I jump in? If I don't, it won't be my revival. So revival starts with me and you. You must be awakened. I know there's always some that are like totally already are. Man, pastor could say, first one in the parking lot is going to get a blessing and you would run through the wall. I get that. But it, it doesn't need to be some. What if it was a high proportion? What if it was all? 
What if we all said, hey, for this season, there's going to be one agenda, and it's God. It's God. We'll change whatever we have to change. We'll do whatever we have to do. We'll go wherever we have to go, but we will touch God. What if we were so awakened that we snapped out of all these other priorities, all these other concerns, all these other thoughts and busyness, and we made space for heaven? What if I wasn't just along the ride, but I was a driver of revival? I was an epicenter of an outpouring of the Holy Ghost that would propagate this to everywhere I went and everyone I touched. Come on, somebody, wake up and be revived. Wake up and be revived. Oh, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Who? okay. We're going to have a time of prayer, and that's going to be super cool. But I need, to, I need to make a reminder here. If you have never been baptized in Jesus' name, you should do it tonight. And let me tell you why. If you will go down in the water in Jesus' name, the Bible tells us your sins are washed away, and it will change your life. There has also never been a better time to get into the kingdom than right now. We've seen some stuff happen at the point of baptism that's not even in the book. And I hope it's not offensive to say, but I'm telling you the truth. And I know it's anecdotal, but I have seen addicts go down and come up and they're not addicts anymore. I have baptized people that were so drunk, I didn't know if I was supposed to be baptizing them because they were slurring their words that bad. And I didn't know if they were sincere until they came up out of the water and they talked perfect instantly sober and never craved alcohol again we've had people go down with anxiety come up no more anxiety go down with depression come up no more depression what would stop you from getting baptized right now tonight we got robes you can wear so your clothes won't get wet do it tonight do it tonight come on somebody do it tonight Amen. Pastors up here, uh, wave your hands. Up in this corner, our ministry team, if you're willing to get baptized, I want you to come up here and tell them, and we'll get you ready and get you baptized. Turn to somebody next to you and ask them the question, what would stop you from getting baptized right now? And if they say nothing, I want you to bring them up here, and we're going to baptize right now. Come on, ask somebody. Ask somebody, what would stop you from getting baptized right now? Come on, there's one. Is there anybody else? Come on, let's do this. God will change your life. There's another. Come on, is there anybody else? Come on, Jesus will change your life. It's revival. It's revival. Is there anybody else? Come on. Come on. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. Turn to somebody. Ask them what would stop you. What would stop you? <laughs> yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We got another. Yes, yes. Come on, let's thank the Lord. Let's thank the Lord. Jesus is doing something. Jesus is doing something right now. Hallelujah. Come on, revival is here. It's not coming, it's now. Don't you wait for another week. Don't wait for another speaker. Don't wait for another song. It's now. It is now. All right, I want everybody to come. I want everybody to come. God is about to awaken something. He's about to revive something. There's about to be a mighty shock out of heaven. Oh, come on, come on, would you come? Bring somebody with you, would you come?
Amen. I want to give you just a little bit of direction. Amen. I've realized over the last few weeks, and I would love to preach on this, but I don't even know how to articulate it. But I've realized over the last few weeks that I probably have missed a whole bucket of my Christianity being misappropriated and misfocused in other directions. At some point, I guess I just was confused and believed that Christianity was about some of the externals. It was about what God wanted on the outside. And I do. I want to be a good Christian on the outside. I want to give and I want to go and I I want to do this and do that and be productive. But more than ever over the last few weeks, I have realized that Christianity is an intrinsic experience. It is about the purging of sin from the soul and the pursuit of God. At the end of the day, we have got to be hungry and desperate for God. We have got to love him more than and everything else more than money more than self more than family we've got to be hungry for God right now I want you to pray I don't need you to be loud I don't need you to dance but I need you to be hungry and tell this God you want him now Come on right now, across this room, get everything else out of the way. Every other thought, every other sin, every other distraction, and get hungry for God. Lord, we want you. We desperately, totally want you. I want you to awaken me right now. I want you to revive me right now. I want you to make me hungry again, desperate again. Ah, I want you with every fiber of my being. Come on, somebody. Lord, I love you and adore you. Take down my every hesitation. I want you tonight. I want to hear you, to see you, to know you, to be near to you. I want to be like you and an extension of you. God, let me to walk with you. Come on, somebody, let everything else fall. Let everything else crumble. Jesus, we love you. Come on, lift your voice. Lift your voice. Oh, revive me. Have you ever prayed until you lost all track of time and of space and you were just caught up in him? Have you ever prayed until you cared about nothing else and no one else? Jesus, we want you. We want you. Come on, revival is here.
come on. Come on, somebody. If you... If you were to tell the truth, what is it that you want the most in this life? Come on, between you and God right now, I want you to close your eyes. Between you and God right now, what do you want the most? Hear me, you are the king or the queen of your own heart, your ambitions. You set up what is on the throne of your soul. If something else has taken that place, I want you to kick it off right now and let God reign supreme. If you've gotten distracted, if there's another priority, I want you to rearrange right now from this moment on. I am yours. I want you. Come on, somebody's waking up now. 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 Come on, somebody is reviving now. You will not be the same. You're not going back to the same sin and the same condition and the same brokenness revive revive yes 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 Come on, come on, not lip service. I want you to mean it. I want you to mean it more than I ever have been before. I am sold out to you, God. All of me, every dime, every bit of time, every bit of energy, all my family is yours. All my hopes are yours. All my ambitions are yours. Everything I am, everything I am to become, I am yours. God, I will settle for nothing else than you. I want you tonight. Oh. Come on, there is so much anointing in this room right now. I am telling you, it doesn't matter what you've struggled with, it can end now. It doesn't matter how sick you have been, you can be healed now. It doesn't matter how empty you are, God can fill you now. Come on, somebody, would you lift your voice? Yes, Jesus. Yes. Yes. Jesus. 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 Come on, we're not manufacturing this. This is real. This is sincerity. God is moving on hearts and lives, and I want it. I want to be in the middle. I don't care how long I've served God. I need this myself. If God's to go anywhere else with it, I've got to catch it myself. Come on, let's love him. Let's enter in like we know to. Come on, I can feel they're already four, five, six, seven of you. You're there. You are in the throne room right now. You're plugged into something that is beyond you and bigger than you. I'm telling you, when you leave this place, you're going to have revival break out like you've never seen before. I'm telling you, in your family, it's going to happen because you've caught what Moses caught. Where you go, you will radiate like he did. Come on, somebody. There is something in in this room right now. God is doing something in this 
city right now. Yes, come on. Amen. We're going to do a little exercise right now. Amen. We've seen two. Now I need you to see a whole lot more in your mind. I want you in your mind to put everybody in that tank that you thought never could have made it there. I want you to put your unsaved family members in there. I want you to put your co-workers in there. I want you to put your classmates in there. I want you, come on somebody, in your mind right now, I want you to believe God can do it. And then I want you to pray that God would bring that kind of revival, that we would be baptized in 20, 30, 40 on a Sunday. Come on, somebody. Jesus, revive us. Yes. Amen. Amen. He can do it. He can do it. Hallelujah. Amen. Is there anybody else that wants to go down in the name of Jesus? Tonight is the night. God will wash away every sin. Come on. Tonight is the night. Yes. Yes. That's it. That's it. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 Oh.